My preferred way to describe test-driven development is red-green refactor. My first video on this channel described the three mindsets that I think it's helpful to adopt at each of these stages. I think that all three are often misunderstood, but today let's talk about maybe the most misunderstood of all, the last one, refactor. What sorts of things should you be looking for at this point? What are our objectives? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Thank you to our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're great supporters of our channel, so please do check out their links in the description below to support them in turn. My new training course, Test Driven Development and Behaviour Driven Development, designed through testing, can help you to gain the skills that allow you to build better software faster, gain more confidence in your code and have more fun while you're doing it. It also gives you the skills that are valued by employers around the world, so do check out the link here in, and in the description below. The three mindsets that are at the core of test-driven development are that we focus first on the design of the external experience of our code, what it does, not how it does it. Next, we take the smallest, simplest steps to make it work. And finally, we focus on the internal design of our solution to make it great. Red, green, refactor. We begin by designing our code purely from the perspective of a consumer of it. We do this by writing a test that expresses as clearly as we can something that we wish our code could do, focusing only on the visible outcome that we expect to observe from the outside. We get this little automated specification of the desirable behaviour of our code to the point where we have a nice, clear, ideally simple statement of what it is that we expect to see, and enough of it so that our test can run but not yet pass. In fact, our goal is to get it to fail, but in a useful way, demonstrating that our code doesn't yet do something that we'd really like it to. Now, with our test clearly showing us that our code, what our code needs to do, we make it do it. Surprisingly, this step is probably the least important one in many ways. In fact, at this point, we're at our most tactical. We're trying to make change in small, safe steps. And right now, we have a test that's failing. One of the common mistakes that I see newcomers to test-driven development make at this point is to spend too much time worrying about a perfect solution. It may seem weird, but this isn't really the goal of this step. This isn't really the time to worry about the design of our solution, even though we're at the point of making our test pass. Our aim at this point is to make it pass with the fewest changes, proceeding in those small safe steps. That means we can do dumb things if we want. For example, it's okay to hard code a return value at this point as long as it makes all our tests pass. I know that this sounds dumb, but the idea is to hurry along safely to the point where we can do the real work. The last step in red-green refactor. And the last of the three mindsets, this is where we focus on the implementation. If you think about well-designed code, there are two perspectives. The external public view that is exposed to the outside world and users of the code, and the internal implementation detail, which in good code is hidden from the outside world, its implementation. Good test-driven development helps us to consider these two aspects of our code independently of one another or at least semi-independently. In red, we're trying really hard to express what we want our code or system to do, while trying as hard as we can to say little or nothing about how we achieve these externally visible outcomes. I showed an example recently of a collection of tests with two different implementations that made the same tests pass in both cases. This is our goal. The implementation, though, needs to be good we still want it to be good, well-written code. So we want to spend a little time working on that too. That's what the refactor step is for. 
So red is focused on the external design, refactor is really focused on the internal design of our code. Green is meant to be a short step to stability. That's what I mean when I said it was tactical. So the first step and the final step are all about design really, with refactoring focused mainly on great internal design, but also giving us a chance to sanity check the guesses that we made when we designed the outside view of our code during red. So what sorts of things are we looking for when we're refactoring? The first thing to think about is what the word refactoring really means. It means a behaviour preserving change. If you refactor to add a new feature or fix a bug, it isn't refactoring. You may refactor to make it easier to add a new feature or fix a bug in future, but at the end of the refactoring, your code or system should do exactly what it did before. Only it does it better in some way. Actually, I guess it doesn't have to be better. We could refactor the code to be worse, but we'd be doing something weird at that point or we'd be very bad programmers. So what does better really mean in this context? It could mean almost anything as long as it preserves the behaviour of our code. But I'd start with looking for several things. I want my code to be readable. I don't mean this in the narrow sense of if you're an expert computer scientist you can read it. I mean that it's probably readable even if you're not and that you can probably see almost at a glance what the code in front of you does. Could someone who understands the problem that you're trying to solve read the code, understand the words used and quickly understand what this part of the code that they're currently reading does? Even if they aren't a programmer maybe. I'm proud of my code when it clearly communicates my intent. So I want my tests and my code to make little sentences. They're going to be in a weird grammar because they're written within the constraints of a programming language. But humans are pretty good at it's interpreting meaning if the words that we pick help them. This is going to be harder in some languages than others perhaps, but it's also a good goal to aim for even if you can't hit it perfectly. Here's some very simple code. It's part of code that adds fractions. Given that context and assuming that you know how to add fractions, I think that you can tell what this is doing, even if you don't know Java. I may need to explain that bang equals means not equal and asterisk means multiply, but the rest is in language that makes sense in the context of the problem. Here's some more technically complex code. This is soundly in a technical problem domain. So to understand it, you need to understand that kind of problem. You need to know that there are things called parameters and that they, they may sometimes need decoding and that we can store groups of parameters in arrays. But this is just understanding the language of the problem domain that we're dealing with. I think this code expresses its intent fairly clearly even so and in a way that you could easily change the lower level implementation of the functions and classes that it uses without changing this function at all. So that's pretty good. I'd say that as a result, the act of me striving to make it readable has made this code better. It's also more readable because it's small and focused on a single task, in this case selecting an appropriate parameter decoder. This code is not also iterating over the list of parameters, for example. This, that is dealt with in a separate part of the code. It's also not doing the decoding itself. That happens somewhere else too. All this code is doing is selecting the appropriate decoder for a given parameter. This means this code is very flexible. In my project that I built this code for, this is used in code that translates a binary data stream into a function call. It uses a Java function as a template that defines the function call. Why doesn't matter much, but I wanted this code to be fast. So these decoders are selected at initialization time. I build up a little translator for each function made up of a collection of parameter decoders. So at runtime, all I need to do is invoke each parameter decoder in sequence to process the message into arguments and make a call. This is very fast, but I could use the same code at other times in other scenarios if I wanted to. 
If I wanted to handle more dynamic messages, for example, I could add something to the message that defining the type of parameter that a field represents. That doesn't change this code in any way at all. Now I could use this code at message invocation time to select the correct decoder. This would be slower than my implementation, but could ha handle um, bigger differences in messages more easily. See how by focusing on making the pieces of my code simple and readable, they tend now to be more general and maybe just maybe more flexible and so more reusable in future. It has yet unforeseen circumstances. This is not me designing ahead, this is just me designing defensively so that it might be useful in future. So, as well as being better because it's readable, it's also better because it's more flexible. I've leaked in two other important targets for refactoring here. To help the code's readability, I made it modular, and I've chosen to actively separate the concerns. Each part of our code should be focused on doing one thing. In this case, finding the appropriate decoder. This has lots of benefits if our code is more modular. It means that we can use it in different contexts, and so it's more flexible, as we've described. But it also introduces an equally important idea. It allows us to abstract the modules. And this starts to give us a way of thinking about the code at different resolutions of detail. Now we can think about how to clearly and effectively implement the fine-grained detail here while we're refactoring, while also separately thinking about the conversations between the pieces of our system at the level of modules. The problems of selecting a parameter decoder are completely divorced from how we found the parameters, or how we will use them later on. As we refactor, tidying up our implementation under the cover of our passing test, this is a good time to review the practicalities of the design decisions that we made earlier. When we started with our failing test, or perhaps even earlier than that, maybe we missed a concept completely, or maybe our implementation doesn't have all of the info that it needs to work well at this point, or maybe we suddenly realise that our code is trying to do two things instead of only one, or maybe we're just starting to realise that we really don't like where this is heading. This kind of feedback on the quality of our design is multi-layered and invaluable. I think that my suggestions for managing complexity from my modern software engineering book are a great guideline for refactoring, as well as using the testability of our code to enhance these properties, as I described here. I also recommend that you use them as guidelines to improve your implementation during refactoring. Prefer code that improves modularity and use separation of concerns to steer you in your choice of modules. This will inevitably improve the quality of your cohesion in your code too. Even at this level of fine-grained detail, the ideas of loose coupling and abstraction are great tools. Choose sensible abstractions in your choice of variables and in the parameters that you pass to even private functions. Aim at every level for your code to keep secrets between its callers and callees. This is the primary focus of the refactoring step in test-driven development. Of course, this isn't the only use of refactoring, and if you'd like to see more on that, check out this free course on my training site. In test-driven development, though, we still have that bigger picture. As I've already said, the refactoring step is a great chance to spot new directions for your design. Here is a simple example. I was writing a game, the kids game, Battleships, as a coding exercise. I was working on the code that represented the game sheet, the grid of squares where the players play, place their ships before the battle. At this point, I'd started working on the features to add the ships to the grid. But there was something about this code that was bothering me. My tests and implementation for the game sheet were getting increasingly complex. Something didn't feel quite right about this. So I tried a few ideas to check my design, and it jumped out at me. I was missing the concept of the rules of the game. I refactored my code to introduce the concept of rules. I moved the tests that I'd wrongly started adding to my game sheet specification to a new rules specification, and bingo, everything got simpler. 
It is not obvious to me that there is anything else that does this, that gives us this kind of feedback. By consciously organising my work in a way that allows me to be thoughtful about my design choices at the level of fine-grained detail and at the higher level structure in the code, I'm able to spot mistakes sooner. In this example, my design mistake was in reality probably only 10 or 15 lines of code and maybe 5 or 6 test cases. Maybe I would have spotted this anyway, but I don't think so. In part, what set off my alarm bells was that I was trying to name things and the names weren't making sense to me. This is one of the many benefits of working to make our code more readable but also the little feedback loops that we establish around me, the developer, the tests that I write, and the code that I am creating. If I listen carefully for the messages that are being sent to me from the code and the tests, and my own design thinking, then I end up doing a better job. Refactoring is a crucial step in building better design code when practicing test-driven development, so never ignore it or shortcut it. Always pause and think about how you could improve your tests and your code. Thank you very much for watching.